today. I'm going to read scripture for us and then I'll jump into the message. We're going to be in John chapter 14 today. If you have your Bibles, open up toward the back. You'll find the guy's names, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Stop at John and go 14 pages to the right. If you've gone to Acts, A-C-T-S, you've gone a little bit too far and head on back. For all of the Bible experts who have already beaten everyone to the page, humility is a real Christian virtue. So, I'm going to read a few verses and then, like I like to do, we're going to go through a lot of Bible today, so we can gear up for that. Chapter 14, starting in verse 5. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you you do know him and have seen him. Will you pray with me? God, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for the truth of your word. Jesus, you say that thy word is truth. And so, Lord, we just want to know the truth today. We also want to know the person who is the truth. So speak to us today. Be close to us. In your name we pray. Amen. All right. How many of you know a ton of pop culture mantras? All right, how many of you just could go on like a pop culture trivia quiz and just, just get all these things right? I want to I share with you a few of them. All right, there's some pop culture quotes that most people in this room would know, but here's one of them. I'm king of the world. Maybe you don't know that, but if I'm standing on the edge of a huge ship and I put my arms out like this and I go, I'm king of the world. I like the other one from that movie. I'll never let go. I'll never let go. But then she did let go. And I was like, hmm. What about there's no place like home? Yeah, yeah, we know that one, right? No place like home. Or what about this one? I'll be back. <laughs> Little side note, at our life group last Monday, we had a, a, our social night where we just got together and played games. We played a game called Utter Nonsense. And what you do is there's a card that has like a saying on it, and then you have another card that has an accent in which you have to say the saying. And the accent card was Arnold Schwarzenegger, and I was like, my time to shine has come. Um, I have liked Arnold for a long time. Uh, I have some of his movies and stuff like that, like his bodybuilding movies. I just love Arnold, so I'll be back, right? Um, That one's one to remember there. What about, remember, George, no man is a failure who has friends. How many of you know that? Okay, a couple couple correct answers in the back. This isn't bingo, so you can't shout it out, all right? But that was from It's a Wonderful Life. What about Louis? I think this is the beginning of a beautiful friendship. Casablanca, okay. Roads? Where we're going, we don't need roads. Back to the future, okay. I should have said text in your answers to 8212. No, I'm just kidding. What about Hakuna Matata? It means no worries. Oh, All right. Lion King screaming in the back. All right. There was a a mantra that has shown up recently in pop culture that caught my attention. But if you, uh, well, not recent one. This is a big one. What about um, may the force be with you? All right. Star Wars. Uh, Some of you don't like Star Wars, all right? Like that was like your generation's like movie like of all time, right? Like I remember my parents saying they went on a date to see that, uh, like to go see it. Um, in the 70s. I love Star Wars. My wife is a huge Star Wars fan, and there's been a kind of another series that has kind of spanned off of Star Wars, and they're on, you know, different networks. You can watch them on, like, Disney+, Plus, but it's called The Mandalorian, and there's a mantra within The Mandalorian where they say this. They go, this is the way, all right? And this is the way. It, what it does is it embodies what it means to be a Mandalorian, and it includes a code of traditions and ideals that they all must uphold. This is from I'm, I love Mandalorians.com, so um, you know it's true. Um, 
But one of the interesting things, they don't take off their helmet ever. They don't let anyone else take off their helmet. And if they've committed like some kind of a grievance against the code, then they have to atone for their sin. But it's interesting because he says several different points in the show, he says, this is the way. And they look at each other, this is the way. And they keep going. And I was thinking about that because today in our, in our passage today, Jesus doesn't say this is the way. He says, I am the way. All right. And as we're going through these I am statements, remember they're, they're all kind of the, the gospel of John is centered around this larger central theme that Jesus is, or all eternal life is found in Jesus. He is the, the way, the truth, and life. This is kind of the culmination of what he's been saying in the gospel of John thus far. And, and it gets to our statement today, and I read it as part of our reading, but he says, I'm the way and the truth and the life. But as we've done the last few weeks, we've realized that this isn't a mantra, right? This isn't something that, you know, you follow. This isn't like, again, a cool pop cultural reference. This is kind of the essence of who he is. He's been, he's been answering that who, it, who am I question or who is Jesus question throughout all these seven I am statements. And we've been looking at his answer to the question of who is Jesus. And so today as we jump into this passage, um, again, not a mantra, but the real description of who he is, I want to show you some context behind it. Because like we've been doing for the last few weeks, you can't just pull this out. Maybe this is, might be the, the one that you can actually pull this out. But you would want to know why he says that he is the way. Why he says, I am the truth. And why he says, I am the life. Well, in the surrounding context, there are three predictions there's some troubled hearts, and there's a question from one, his, one of his disciples. And so what are those three predictions? Well, first of all, Jesus predicts his death. In John chapter 12, verses 20 through 36, Jesus says, Now is the time where the Son of God will be glorified, like that the, or the Son of Man will be glorified. And he, what he's saying is, it's about time for me to die, to be lifted up, to die, to lay my life down for you. And it gets to this point in chapter 12 where he says, My soul is troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it is for this very reason that I came to this hour. And he says, Father, glorify your name. He will tell his disciples, I'm about to go to the cross. I'm going to lay my life down. I'm about to glorify the Father. And, and his soul is troubled at this moment. But he says, it's not for me and what I want. I will submit to the way of the Father. And I will go the way I'm supposed to go. And for the disciples, they're starting to see this and starting to realize, well, Jesus is kind of troubled about this whole thing. They're in Jerusalem to celebrate Passover in the last week of his life. And, and part, of our dis, part of our discussion today in this text is, that upper room discourse where Jesus has the last conversation with his disciples. John records the longest version of it over uh, uh, four chapters, 14, 15, 16, and 17 there. And, and, and this is leading up to it, though. He says, I am about to be glorified, or I'm going to die. I'm going to, be, I'm going to lay my life down. Then, after that, he predicts Judas' betrayal. So while he's with the disciples and they're there in the upper room, in chapter 13, verses 18 through 30, he talks about how someone's actually going to come and betray him. And if you look at verse 21, it says, After he said this, Jesus was again troubled in his spirit. And he testified, Very truly I tell you, one of you is going to betray me. Again, last few hours that he's with his disciples and his soul is troubled. Now it says that he was troubled in his spirit. And then he said, look, one of you is going to do this. They're going to betray me. And interesting in John's gospel, the, the prediction of the betrayal is a little bit more intense. And he actually tells Judas to go and do what he has to do. And it talks a little bit more about what happens with Judas. And, and finally, Jesus answered because, because, um, it says, leaning back in Jesus, he asked, this is Peter, Lord, who is it? And Jesus answered, it is the one to whom I will give this piece of bread when I have dipped it in the dish. Then, dipping the piece of bread, he gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. And as soon as Judas took the bread, Satan entered him. So Jesus told him, what you are about to do, do quickly. So Jesus hasn't even said this I am statement yet, but we already have a prediction of his death. Which, is gonna, which makes his heart troubled or his soul troubled. And then the betrayal of one of his closest disciples, that's going to trouble his spirit. Now, I think I've said before, like, you know, Judas obviously deserves kind of the reputation that he has because of what he did. But like 
he was trusted because he was the one who dealt with the money. Okay, I have a lot of friends and there's only one or two of them that I would actually let control my money, okay, or handle my money. So he was at least in some way trusted and yet he is the one who's going to betray. And then it shifts and now Peter does another, or Jesus does another prediction. He predicts Peter's denial. Which again, Peter, if you've seen or read any of the New Testament, Peter kind of stands as like the representative of the disciples. If you were to say that, that Jesus had a favorite, John would say it was John, because that's what John does in his Gospels. He calls himself the beloved disciple, okay? But you would probably guess that Peter might be one of the, if the closest. Now, he takes, Jesus always takes Peter, James, and John. So there's always a three, an inner three that meet with Jesus and go certain places and get the revelation that only Jesus gives to those three. And then others share about it. But Peter, you would never expect him to turn his back on Jesus. In chapter 13, verse 31 through 38, we see Jesus' interaction with Peter and, and talking about how Peter was actually going to betray him. Simon Peter asked him in verse 36, Lord, where are you going? Jesus says, I'm going to go somewhere. He's like, you can't come with me now, but you will go later. And so he says, well, where are you going and Jesus replied, where I'm going, you cannot follow now. You will follow later. And Peter asked, Lord, why can't I follow you now? I will lay my life down for you. What a pretty bold claim, right? I'm going to lay my life down for you, Lord. Like, where, let's go now. I want to go with you now. Wherever you're going, I want to go. And I, I love that that's Peter's response. But then Jesus answered him and says, will you really lay down your life for me? Okay, you can talk a big game, Peter. Right, you can say you're going to go with me. You can say you can lay your life down. But will you really, will you really do it? Then he says, very truly I tell you, before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. Okay, three predictions, right? Predicting Jesus predicts his death. Jesus predicts Judas's betrayal. And Jesus predicts Peter's denial. Do you think the disciples are in a very happy mood at this point? No, they're not, right? I mean, they know that they're going to Jerusalem and Passover's there and they're supposed to be celebrating a meal of God's deliverance, God's great rescue from, from Egypt, God's deliverance from slavery in Egypt and, and they're supposed to share this meal together and it's supposed to be a time of celebration. This is the time when you celebrate all the amazing things God has done for God's people. And now Jesus is troubled. Then he's troubled again. And now Simon Peter is troubled and all the disciples are going like, wait, we saw one of them leave. We know he's going to betray. We saw him go like, okay, what is going to happen? And so we get chapter 14, verse 1. Don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. My father's house has plenty of room. If that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. Okay, he says what to them? It's, it's a command. He says, don't let your hearts be troubled. Now, he's not yelling at them. You could tell it's like in this setting, it's probably a gentle, like, hey, don't let your hearts be troubled. Why do you think he says that? Because their hearts were troubled, right? Three predictions. Troubled Jesus in soul and spirit. And they're going like, okay, what is going on? He's like, hey, I don't want you to, be, I don't want you to have your hearts in trouble. Like, don't let them be in trouble. Then he says a pretty profound statement. He addresses the troubled heart by saying what? He says, trust in God. Trust also in me. In fact, if you were to translate this from Greek, the New Testament was written in Greek. If you were to translate it from Greek to English, there are eight different ways you can translate this based on like the kind of tense and the, um, the case of the words. And to save you... Boredom for 35 seconds. I'll just say they all are saying one thing. Trusting in God is trusting in Jesus. That's what he's trying to say. If you want to put all of your trust in God, but you also can put all of your faith, your trust in me. In fact, the word really isn't trust. It's believe in God. Believe also in me. It's that belief we talked about. You got to keep on believing. You got to keep on trusting. Full commitment to God. And he's saying that is full commitment to me. Trust in God, trust also to me. And then he offers them a promise. Right? He says, my father's house has plenty of room. If it were not so, 
Like, why would I have told you I'm going there to prepare a place for you? Now, this can be, like, mistranslated and misinterpreted to, like, I think the King James used the word mansions, and it doesn't really mean mansions. It means a, a dwelling place, and it says that there's already a house, so it's not like he's building these amazing mansions, you know, with a nice quartz countertop and a backsplash in your kitchen with all the fine, you know, Property Brothers type remodel stuff, okay? Um, it's not that kind of prepare a place for you. In fact, how many times do we read the word Father's house in the Bible? Only a few times. And the first time we've ever read it, and the only other time we've read it in the Gospel of John, it's talking about the, the temple. The temple, right? My Father's house is supposed to be a house of prayer for the nations, but you have made it a den of robbers. So the Father's house, when it's used for the temple, the temple was supposed to be the place where heaven and earth met. That was the space where God invaded earth, heaven and earth met, and so Jesus, what he's doing is he's, he's kind of hinting at this new city, this new place, this new world where God would meet with human beings and would be all and would be in all. And, and that's a very much like forward, second coming, new world, resurrection life type of phraseology right there. And they can trust Jesus because he's going to prepare that place. That's what he is doing from here till, till he returns, is preparing the place. And basically what he's saying is all are welcome in this renewed city, this renewed house, this new father's house. I love how in the Revelation it doesn't talk about a temple because there's no need for a temple. Why? Because God is dwelling with his people in new heavens and new earth. There is no need for a temple because God is there. You don't need him to come and down and dwell. He's just going to be there. And Jesus is hinting at this. In other words, where I'm going, I'm going so that you can come to you will be welcome to be where I am. We're not supposed to get fixated on the houses and the mansions. And there's a bunch of different rooms that we can, like, it's meant to be that God has a place in eternity for everyone. And Jesus is making that. He is the way to get there. He is the way to be in that, that new heavens and new earth that is pictured in the New Testament. So all that leads up to what? Thomas's question. So he says, Lord, we don't know where we're going, so how can we know the way? How can we know the way? Now, if you guys know Greek, you'll notice that the word know changes a couple different times in here. If you don't know Greek, there's a little fact for you, okay? Thomas, when he says, Lord, we don't know where you are going, so how can we know the way? The word there is not the same word that Jesus says when it, that you, if you really know me, you will know my Father. It's a different no, all right? No, it's not the same no, all right? That was a bad joke, okay. The kind he uses there is something like seeing is believing, like if we can see it, if we have the sight to see it, then we can perceive it. So if, if we haven't seen the way, how can we then know the way? Like if we haven't seen it, how can we perceive the way? And so how does Jesus answer the question? Well, he does it with the I am statement. He goes, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Jesus uses a different word for the word know. And this is the word that I shared a few weeks ago. It's that it's an intimate knowledge of the person in which you are in a relationship with. It's not, just not a head knowledge. It's not seeing as believing. It's knowing somebody to the point where you know how they behave. You know how they think. You, you know their heart. You know the way in which they live. Like, you know somebody. It's the same word used between, uh, the word know is the same word used to describe when, when a husband would know his wife, all right? The idea that there's an intimate bond that happens between two people, and that's the kind of knowing that you know. And Jesus says, if you really knew me, if you had that intimate relationship with me, if you, if you knew me on that level, Thomas, then you would already know my father as well. And he goes, from now on, you do know him and you have seen him. He goes, Lord, show us the father. Philip now responds, Lord, show us the father that we, that, and that will be enough for us. Then again, he says, don't you know me? Like, like Philip, I imagine he'd be, hey, Phil, right? Like shorten it a little bit. Phil, come on, don't you know me? Like we've been spending time. This is three years in the making. You have seen me on the road. You've seen me heal. You, you've seen me heal the demon possessed. You've seen me feed the thousands of people. You, you've seen me do all these. You've heard me teach. Don't you know me by now? 
even after I've been among you such a long time, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? The words I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. Believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Or at at least believe on the evidence of the works themselves. Like if you've spent any time with me, Philip and Thomas, if you've spent any time with me, everything I've done, everything I've said, the way in which I've lived, I've been trying to show you the Father over and over again. Don't you know me by now? If you did, you would know that the Father is in, like he's trying to say, like, look, I'm doing the things of the Father. Like the life of God is in me right now. Like I'm trying to show you that. And so he says, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. So Jesus is the way to God. The way is, the, is referring here not a path, not, a, uh, not a, a street on a map, not a journey, but it is a course of behavior. In other words, Jesus is saying, like, I am the way to the Father because you can see the, everything that I've done up to this point. We're in chapter 14, so in chapters 1 through 13, everything I've done is to try to show you the Father, show you that I am the way. This is my course of behavior. Again, he doesn't show us a way to God. He shows us, or not, he doesn't show us a way. He is the way to God. Everything he has done is the way to God. His very person is the way to God. And he's trying to tell him, come on, we've been together. Like, haven't, like, don't you, haven't you known me yet? Like, don't you, don't you know, not just the seeing, but don't you know? He also says that he is the truth. And I think this means he's saying, I am the truth of God. If you look this up in its context, it means the content of what is true. In other words, all of reality rests in Jesus. All of the things that are true, everything that could and would be true is in Jesus. He is the truth. Again, he doesn't exhibit a truth about God or a path to God or a way to view reality. He is the truth. Mind-blowing in and of itself. He is the truth. Again, it's not a teaching. It's not a philosophy. It's not an ideology. Truth is a person. Truth is a person. Then he says, Jesus is the life. Like He is the life of God. That word in its context means the transcendent life of God, the eternal life that only comes from God, only possible in and through God. And Jesus says, I am the life. Again, in a world that is going to end in death, we all wake up to die. He says, I am the life, the life that you've always wanted, the life that will sustain you for all eternity. That is who I am. Again, he doesn't testify to the life of God. He is the life and light of God. That's what John has been saying. In the very first chapter, he opened up with that. He's been saying that all along, right? I am the light of the world. Like, and he's saying, in me, there is life. I am the life of God. Again, Thomas says, seeing is knowing, and Jesus says, you have to have an intimate knowledge of me, intimate knowing. So when you know Jesus, you know the way. When you know Jesus, you know the truth. And when you know Jesus, you know the life that only belongs to God, that only comes from God, that extends out to give us eternal life from God. Why? Because he says, the Father and I are one. Not like a husband and wife are married and become one. No, like they are one in ontology. Okay, I'm going to use a big word for the day. I can be smart every once in a while, okay? Ontology, being. They are in one being. Two persons. And then the Holy Spirit would be the third persons. But one being. They're, they're in relationship, but they are one in being. And he's saying, the Father and I, we, we are one. In other words, if you want to see God, you look to Jesus. And when you look to Jesus, you see God. And when you, when you look to God, you see Jesus. He said, that's what he's trying to say. Like, I am the way, I'm the truth, I'm the life. It's all about me, and it all has been about me. Amen. <laughs> in other words, he's saying, everything I've done proves that he is in the Father, and the Father is in him. And he says, my works have displayed that. Everything I've done, all the miracles, all the teaching, all the healings, all the... We're just on the edge of him raising Lazarus from the dead. And I switched that around on purpose to talk about that on Easter, just to kind of match a theme going on there. Okay, so we'll get to that a little bit later. But this is right after that happened. 
And so for him to say, oh, I'm the life, like you saw what happened to Lazarus, like I am the life. If you would have known me, you would have known that the Father is already in me. Well, that's our text today. So let's talk about three ways to respond to the way. All right, because he is the way. We should start saying that. Instead of this is the way, like the Mandalorians, we go, he is the way. Now, Jesus Revolution, not to like oversight that movie, but they used to say one way, right? Put up the finger, right? Like the way. I don't know. That's, that's bad. But anyway, no more mantras. Here's the first way to respond to the way. We have to trust in Jesus as the remedy for a troubled heart. I mean, that's, I think, the clearest point from the story right up front from this passage is all of the predictions of the death, all the predictions of the betrayal and the denial, all of this gloom that's happening on this night, right? That is the thing that's going on is they are troubled. And what does he do? He answers their troubled hearts by saying to trust in God and trust in me. And then he will say what he's about to do. And then he says, I am the father, we're one. So trust in me. And that's what we have to do to respond to Jesus from this passage is put our trust in him as the remedy for troubled hearts. Kent Hughes, he's a commentator. He suggests this surprisingly true description of our times. He calls this the cardiac age. Troubled hearts are everywhere. Can we agree on something like that? In case you don't believe me, let's talk about some troubled hearts that we have today. How many of us are dealing with family relationships that are, that are divided and broken and hurting? And it causes our hearts to be troubled. How many of us like, worry at night about the relationships that have, that have been broken and that are, that are like at this point, what we think is beyond repair? We were talking in our sermon prep group and it was brought up that growing old can trouble our hearts. Changes in body, right? Going to the doctors more often. How many of us get troubled when we think about the things that are out ahead of us? Different surgeries we have planned or different ways in which we can't experience the world the same way and so our hearts begin to be troubled. It can go a little bit more political. Look at the economy, right? Inflation. All right, I don't know how many others, but my taxes went up a lot this last year, all right? Inflation's gone up. How, it's harder to buy like a, tw- a dozen pack of eggs these days. And what, would, what we start thinking, well, if all the prices go up, do I have enough money to survive? Do I have enough to make it, right? And so we start getting troubled and we start worrying. We start dwelling on these things. What about wars and rumors of wars? I mean, that, I mean, that's like a biblical term, a way to think about it, but all the different uprisings that are happening and what if Russia takes a little bit more action and what if they start firing off the nuclear weapons, right? And so, we, so now we get like, you know, shelters in our house and some of you like get really intense with that and have enough food for 20 years and um, I'm gonna come over to your house when eggs go up again, but, or gas prices, right? The supply chain issues, all these can do what? They can trouble our hearts. What about the loss of loved ones? Sometimes the things that happen, they blur the future ahead of us. And our hearts begin to be troubled and they weigh us down. Political unrest, divisions, the culture war, the kids, our kids that are at stake, just protecting them from being, you know, all the ideologies that are being forced on kids at the earliest of ages. Like think about all the things that could trouble our hearts. And then what about the borrowed troubles or the, the things that are imaginary grievances, right? How many of you like, will if say you have like a little hurt on your elbow, will look on WebMD and you start going down the WebMD trail and about two minutes into it, you realize I need to amputate my elbow. <laughs> I... We laugh, but how many of us do that, right? I looked on WebMD, it could be cancer of the elbow and my, it could be stage five. It's like, well, what happened? Well, I just hit it on the door the other day. Like, maybe there's just something else going on. Sometimes the anticipation that we put on ourselves before we arrive to the doctor's office, right? It's like being afraid of of getting injected before like the dentist does like a root, root canal or something, right? That might be more trouble than actually getting the root canal or whatever the, the case may be. Imagined fears sometimes can be worse than reality. And yet, in spite of all this, Jesus is saying, trust in me. 
Keep on trusting in me. Put your full faith, your full commitment. Give all of yourself to me. I am worthy to be trusted. I, he's saying, I am God, the Father and I, we are one. In me is life. In me is truth to all of the troubled hearts. Sometimes we believe the lies so much that they trouble us. He says, I am the truth. Again, if when you, truth is a person, the way is a person, life is a person, when you have that person, you have the way, you have the truth, you have the life, you have the remedy for a troubled heart. Amen. The second way to respond is we got to believe that Jesus was, is, and always will be the only way to God because he is the truth of God and the life of God. I was hoping to get one more amen on that one, but I understand the issue with that statement. Right? In 2023, that sounds arrogant. It sounds bigoted. It sounds exclusive, right? He's the only way. Are you serious? In fact, if I say that, some of you might even start to tune me out. Oh, I thought this was a church that kind of was just kind of okay with other ways. And you might want to put your notes away, maybe send a, you know, a connection card in to, to Pastor Daniel. Um, <laughs> may not even want to come to this church anymore because I, I'm willing to well, put my life on that statement that he is the only way to God. He is the way and the truth and the life. But, you know, to be honest, I think, I think there's something inside me and maybe inside of you that maybe wants to say that that statement in some way is a little unfair. You know, sometimes I think, well, maybe people should be able to, to go to whatever temple or whatever religion, call God whatever name they make up, as, as long as they do with the genuine heart. I think sometimes I think, man, I wish, I wish that was true. I wish, I wish there was a way in which good people could make it to the renewed cosmos that John talks about or hints at here but then the cross stands in the way and we hear God say throughout the gospels this is my son this is my plan for the world there is no other plan there is no plan b Jesus himself, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. It's not about getting to heaven, getting to an afterlife. It's actually being welcomed into the life of God. Like Jesus is saying, I'm making room, I'm making space for you to come into the life of God and to dwell with God forever. It's not a ticket to get out of hell. It's a ticket. It's not really a ticket. It's a way into the life of God that exists between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And so the arrogance of these claims is met with the most all-encompassing, all-welcoming, all-inclusive to, hey, whoever wants to come to Jesus. Again, he is exclusively the way to God the Father, but the invitation is open to everybody. And if you were to like say that, well, that is kind of arrogant, well, and all, aren't all religions the same? Well, then you're saying that those other religions really have, they're, they're, they well, what you're saying is that what they claim is, isn't true about themselves either. Because one quick study of world religions will tell you that, no, we're not all the same. It's not all many paths to God because there's true, truth claims in other religions that would say that other religions are wrong. So there are no all paths to heaven or all roads lead to God. Jesus is pretty clear. I am the way. And if Jesus is just one path or one road alongside many others, like, I don't even know why I'm serving him. Like, why would I serve a God that, if you look at it this way, who tortures and kills his son if there's a bunch of other ways to get there? Why would I follow a God who does the things that God does if, if there's just some other way to get there? Like, it, that would be a very twisted looking God, the wrath of sin coming down on the Son of God, really, when, when you could just be a good person and you know, evaporate into the oneness of the world. Time after time again, Jesus shows us the Father. He moves in grace, shows mercy, compassion, unconditional love. He lays his life down. Remember, he's the good shepherd who lays his life down on the cross. And he does it all because he loves us. He is the way, he is the truth, and he is the life, and he always will be the only way to God. 
So the third way to respond to that then is to continue to do what Jesus did in love and humility. Because I do know that saying he is the only way, the church has used that statement in arrogance and has done it in a way that has received bad reputation, has hurt many people along the way. And, and yet when you look at what Jesus did and what he says is there's no arrogance in this statement. In fact, when Peter, right before Peter, uh, he predicted Peter's denial, he tells him, like, look, I want you to love one another as I have loved you. The chapter before, he washed the disciples' feet. Does that sound pretty arrogant? Oh, I'm the way. Let me wash your dirty feet. In chapter 11, he weeps with those who are grieving and mourning. Mary and Martha, he shows up and he wept with them. He's the God who shows up to weep alongside of us. And remember, he's on his way to lay his life down for the sheep. He's healed the sick. He's restored sight to the blind. He's fed the thousands. This is what Jesus did. So in order, I think sometimes for us in our exclusive claim to him being the only way, and other, some of the ways in which we, we actually make headway in our world is to just do what Jesus did in love and humility. Continue to do that. Proclaim the truth of who he is and then live it out in love and humility. I think that's how that statement of him being the only way Again, has any more weight in our world these days? I think the world's watching, waiting to see. And if we show up with love and humility and just do what Jesus did, preach the truth and then, and then care for those who need to be cared for, I think the world would start to take notice and might realize, you know what, maybe he is the truth, the way of the truth and the life. Because when you look at this, this is not just one claim, like in our modern world against all the other claims that are out there. He either is the way or he's not. Either is the truth or he's not. Either is the life or he's not. And John, in his gospel, has been f- affirming all the way through that this is true of him. That is who he says he is, affirming those statements. So for us, we are called to believe and to respond. So will you pray with me this morning? God, I know a lot of us are in here today with troubled hearts. I could have listed so many other things, so many other issues that cause us worry, cause us trouble in the deep depths of our souls and hearts, Lord, and and it could have gone on for a lot longer. And Lord, yet you still know what we're dealing with. Individually, you know the trouble that's on our hearts. May we be humble enough to trust in you during those times. Trust in you with our troubled hearts. Love what it says in Proverbs, Lord. Trust in the Lord with your heart. And lean not on our own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will make our path straight, Lord. So, Lord, let us do that. Let us take our hearts and, Lord, symbolically give them to you. And Jesus, we do believe and proclaim that you are the way, the truth, and the life. But Lord, as we proclaim that and live that out, give us the courage, give us the strength, give us the wisdom to do that in love and humility. Because Lord, we want more people to find the way, to find the truth, and to find the life. We love you. In your name we pray. Amen. So as we get ready to head out today, I want to remind you we do have pastoral partners who will be up here in, f- in front. And they would love to pray with you. I would encourage you, if you have a troubled heart this morning, to maybe if you don't, maybe don't feel comfortable coming up by yourself, maybe you can grab someone close to you and have them walk up with you and bring them up. But our pastoral partners would love to pray for those specific things and join with you in caring for you as well. And maybe today, if, if you want to walk up to one of them and say, you know what, I want to give my life to Jesus. I want to meet the way. I want to meet the truth and meet the life. I encourage you to do that as well at this time. Um, for everyone else, if you want to come tonight to have some pie in a business meeting, um, I said it like that on purpose, that starts at 6 p.m. tonight. Um, otherwise, I want you to, on your way out, say hi to somebody you don't know and tell them that God loves them. We'll see you guys next week.